Well, it's good to see you again tonight. Please take your Bibles and turn to Acts chapter 28. We're looking again at verses 7 through 10, Miracles and Money, part 4. Acts chapter 28. I'll start reading in verse 6. Howbeit, they looked when he should have been swollen or fallen down dead suddenly, but after that they had looked a great while and saw no harm come to him, they changed their minds and said that he was a god. In the same quarters were possessions of the chief man of the island, whose name was Publius, who received us and lodged us three days courteously. And it came to pass that the father of Publius lay sick of a fever and of a bloody flux, to whom Paul entered in and prayed and laid his hands on him and healed him. So when this was done, others also which had diseases in the island came and were healed, who also honored us with many honors, and when we departed, they laded us with such things as were necessary. Gracious Father, we pray for your blessings upon the going forth of your word tonight. Again, that it would not return void, but that it would accomplish that which you please and prosper in the thing whereto you have sent it. And so, Father, we commit this time to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, as you know, several weeks ago, we showed a film on the uh, fake faith healers, the Signs and Wonders movement exposed. And so much of what we see tonight and what we've been looking at for the last three weeks is the biblical principles that counteract the people who take passages like this and say, well, you see, Paul did some healing and Paul got paid for it. And uh, we, because we're faith healers, we ought to get a lot of money for this too. And so they go through this very bad exposition of the text to try to prove that they should be making a lot of money off of what happens uh, at their so-called revival meetings. But remember, the key to riches is this. It's not what you own, but how you view what you own. It's not what you own, it's how you view what you own. We're going to be adding a lot of scripture references uh, to that principle tonight. But a rich man can be content and not covetous. A poor man can be totally discontent and deadly covetous. God doesn't condemn people for being rich because, after all, God is the one who gave it to them. The Bible says it is God that gives you the power to get wealth. Over in Deuteronomy chapter 8, here's some new passages for you to look at tonight. (coughs) Deuteronomy chapter 8, and I'm going to begin reading in verse 11. And I want you to notice the context as we get to the end of this passage that I'll read tonight. The first part of the passage is in learning to obey God, using what he's given you the way that he designed for it to be given, or way that he designed for it to be used. And in the middle of that, it tells us that God's the one who gives you money. Beware that thou forget not the Lord thy God in not keeping his commandments and his judgments and his statutes which I command thee this day, lest when thou hast eaten and art full, and hast built goodly houses, and dwelt therein, and when thy herds and thy flocks multiply, and thy silver and thy gold is multiplied, and all that thou hast is multiplied. Does this look like somebody who's a diligent person? Somebody who's getting wealthy by doing some work and so on? Well, look at what it says. And then thine heart be lifted up, and thou forget the Lord thy God, which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt and from the house of bondage. He takes them back to where they came from. Who led thee through that great and terrible wilderness, wherein were fiery serpents and scorpions and drought, where there was no water, who brought thee forth water out of the rock of flint, who fed thee in the wilderness with manna which thy fathers knew not, that he might humble thee, and that he might prove thee to do thee good at thy latter end. Before we go on, from whence did you come? Did you know that the hard times that you've gone through in life were for a specific purpose? It was to humble you. It was to test you. And it was to set the stage so that when God did you good, you'd recognize that it came from his hand. Verse 17. Here's the wrong 
response to all those good things, if you haven't kept that in mind, where you came from, how you got there, that it was God who brought you there, that brought you through those tough times to accomplish those three things that we just said. He brought you through all of that so that he might humble you. Did the lesson stick. So that he might prove you, test your mettle, and now, number three, to do the good at the latter end. Hope we learn that lesson because sometimes we say in our heart, my power and the might of mine hand hath gotten me this wealth. Have you become successful? If you live in the United States, if you have a car that you can even drive here, you've become wealthy in relation to all the rest of the world. You have what most of the world does not have. Was it your power? Was it your hand that got you this wealth? Look at verse 18. But thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it is he that giveth thee power to get wealth. Now, if you don't take away anything else from the lesson tonight, remember that phrase. It is God that gives you the power to get wealth. If he blows on it, it evaporates. He can take it all away just like he did with Job. The question is, how do you view what you have? Not whether or not you've got wealth, but how do you view the wealth that God has put into your hands? For it is God that giveth thee the power to get wealth. And here's the reason, that he may establish his covenant, which he swear unto thy fathers as it is this day. God does that so that he can demonstrate that his promises are true. That the covenants he makes he does not break that he will fulfill in the latter end that which is for his glory and for our good. Notice the context. <clears throat> the next two verses give us a very interesting context here. In the morning worship, we've been talking about false gods. The love of money is one of the false gods of our time. So look at the next verse. And it shall be, if thou do at all forget the Lord thy God and walk after other gods and serve them and worship them. I testify against you this day that ye shall surely perish. You know, Israel kept getting blessed by God. They got blessed out of their socks over and over and over, and then they turned to false gods. How stupid is this? It was God who gave them the power to get wealth. It was God who caused them to increase. God has historically, especially with the Jews, given them an amazing knack for earning money. Have you ever perceived that? An amazing knack and talent for many different things. But how frequently they have turned their backs on the God who gave it to them and run after other things and made those objects, which were the gifts that God gave them, the focus of their affection, turned them into false gods. Folks, we do that too. It shall be, if thou do it all, forget the Lord thy God, and walk after other gods, and serve them and worship them. I testify against you this day that ye shall surely perish. As the nations which the Lord destroyeth before your faith, so shall ye perish, because ye would not be obedient unto the voice of the Lord your God. Where did the passage start? It started with keeping his commandments, with obeying him, with doing what he told you to do. And then God brings you through tough times, he shows you that he's the one who's strong. He's the one who benefits you. Don't turn your back on him. And the minute you begin to focus on the things that he gives you, you've turned your back on him, and you are on the cusp of destruction. Remember, it is God that giveth thee the power to get wealth. Having money is clearly a stewardship given by God. <coughs> Use it wisely or he will take it away, or he might let you keep it but take away your ability to use it. Did you know that? The Bible says that specifically. God can take away the wealth that you've got. You think, well, I don't have very much. Well, he can take away what you've got. If you're able to be here tonight neatly and warmly dressed, and you got here somehow by a vehicle, and you have a place to live. You know, God didn't even promise you a place to live. He said, with food and raiment, let us be there with content. A lot of us complain about it. But if God has provided you that much, you're far ahead of the rest of the world. Money is a stewardship. 
if we don't use it wisely, two things can happen. Number one, he can take it away. Or number two, he can leave it in your possession, but take away your ability to enjoy it. Listen to Ecclesiastes 5.19. Every man also to whom God hath given riches and wealth, and hath given him power to eat thereof, and to take his portion, and to rejoice in his labor, this is the gift of God. You have physical resources, money, various other nice things that you put up on your shelf and you look at them and you can't do much with them. All you can do is look at them. But they're pleasant to have around. They, they make your environment a little more pleasant. You live in a nice place. You've got a vacuum cleaner so you can clean up the mess that the kids and animals drag in. Have you got things that you really don't need, but you keep them anyway? Every man also to whom God hath given riches and wealth, and hath given him the power to eat thereof, and to take his portion, and to rejoice in his labor. You got a job? Did you ever have a job? Did God provide for you through that job? This is the gift of God. Now let's see the opposite. That's your stewardship. Use it wisely. You can take it away. Or you can take away your ability to use it. Ecclesiastes, the very next chapter, chapter 6. There is an evil which I have seen under the sun. And listen to this last phrase. And it is common among men. This doesn't just happen occasionally. So if there are very, very few illustrations of it. He says, this is common among men. Verse 2. A man to whom God hath given riches, wealth, and honor, so that he wanteth nothing for his soul of all that he desireth. Yet God giveth him not power to eat thereof, but a stranger eateth it. This is vanity, and it's an evil disease. God can give you all that stuff if you handle it wrong. He can take away your ability to enjoy it. He can put you in a cripple's wheelchair, confined to a hospital. A number of years ago, when some of my older children were at Columbia University College of Physicians and Surgeons, <coughs> there was one whole floor of the Presbyterian Hospital, uh, which is the hospital where Columbia focuses most of their training, where many of their professors are professors or surgeons and doctors in that hospital, one whole floor that was dedicated to the care of one specific wealthy woman. All day long she had people running in and taking care of her, but she couldn't move. She lay there, and her estate had more than enough money to keep her going for 500 years or however long. She had had it all. She couldn't enjoy it. She lay there day after day, after day, after day, and couldn't make a decision about spending a nickel of all of her money. They just kept her alive. Comfortable, pleasant surroundings, but able to do nothing. How do you view what God has put into your care? Are you an owner? Be careful, you're about to lose it or lose the ability to use it. Or are you a steward whereby you do your best with what God has given for his glory and if he takes it away, you can say like Job, naked came I forth into this world and naked I return thither. The Lord hath given, the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord material things. He goes on. It's a fascinating chapter, Ecclesiastes chapter 6, because he covers a lot of the things we've been touching on in the other messages. If a man beget an hundred children and live many years, so that the days of his years be many, and his soul be not filled with good, and also that he have no burial, I say that an untimely birth, that is a miscarriage, is better than he. For he cometh in with vanity, and departeth in darkness, and his name shall be covered with darkness. Moreover, he hath not seen the sun, nor known anything, 
This hath more rest than the other, that is the miscarriage. Yea, though he live a thousand years twice told, yet has seen no good. How would you like to live two thousand years? Can you imagine that? Can you imagine having been alive in the days of the Lord Jesus Christ and heard him preaching and teaching and hearing the Apostle Paul preaching and teaching and still be alive today and hear this message tonight? <laughs> hmm. They were better preachers than I was, I guarantee it. Though man live a thousand years twice told, yet hath he seen no good, do not all go to one place. In other words, you're going to die someday. What are you doing right now with what you've got? I can hardly imagine the amount of accountability and responsibility that a person would have if he lived 2,000 years. Think of all the opportunities to blow it over a 2,000-year span of time. And everything that comes into your life every day, you'd be accountable for it in eternity. All the labor of man is for his mouth, and yet the appetite is not filled. How many of you had lunch today? <laughs> All of us did, didn't we? Do you think you might be hungry tomorrow morning? I think so. Why do people work hard? Well, they work hard for many reasons, but you know the number one bottom line principal reason is so they have something to put on the table next meal. All the labor of man is for his mouth, yet the appetite is not filled. For what hath the wise more than the fool? What hath the poor that knoweth to walk before the living? Better is the sight of the eyes than the wandering of the desire. There's covetousness. That's also vanity and vexation of spirit. That which hath been is named already, and it is known that it is man. Neither may he contend with him that is mightier than he. You can't fight with God. It's really stupid to try. Seeing there be many things that increase vanity, what is man the better? Oh, I wish I had time to... <coughs> expound a few of these verses here but it gives you the overview of your view of riches for who knoweth what is good for man in this life all the days of his vain life which he spendeth as a shadow for who can tell a man what shall be after him under the sun you know that was one of the things that grieved Solomon's heart is I've worked hard I've worked like a dog all my life I've studied I've learned I've become the wisest guy on the face of the earth I've got all this riches I've built this and I've built this and I've built this I'm going to leave it to somebody else and who knows whether or not he'll be a fool. Turned out he left it to somebody else who was a fool. His son Rehoboam. Wise man can have a fool for a son. Solomon did. And Rehoboam split the kingdom. Ten tribes went north with Jeroboam. Only two, Judah and Benjamin, remained with the descendants of David. Who can tell a man what shall be after him under the sun? If you want to understand the divine perspective on money and temporal things, spend some time in the wisdom literature of the Bible, especially Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Lamentation, and there's one in the New Testament. Who knows what the one is in the New Testament? Wisdom literature in the New Testament. James. James. James talks a lot about money and the perspective on money. Temporal things. Wisdom literature. <coughs> so in other words, the twofold key to biblical wealth management is this. Here we've got the twofold key to biblical wealth management. If you're taking notes, you ought to write this down. Number one, do you view yourself as a steward who must give an account for what is given to you? That's principle number one of biblical wealth management. Do you view yourself as a steward who must give an account for what is given to you? Number two, are you willing to let it go when God takes it and not look back? Are you willing to let it go when God takes it and not look back. You know, <clears throat> over the last several weeks, we've looked at illustrations from the Bible of people who failed to have the divine, divine perspective on money. The fakes, the charlatans, the apostates, the heretics, they all fall into this category. We saw people like Judas, who always had his needs when he 
met when he was with Jesus, but he wanted more. So he decided to become the most trusted disciple so he could control the money, and he got himself appointed treasurer. Scripture tells us specifically he was a thief, but he's an ex excellent example of an apostate, one who fell away. In his heart, he was greedy. He was willing to sell God the Son for 30 pieces of silver, 10% of the ointment that he thought he should have had in the bag. And we asked ourselves the question, do you get mad when you don't get your own way? What are you willing to do? Are you willing to do anything to get what your carnality wants, no matter how much you're trying to manipulate somebody else? Be careful, you might be a Judas. It's amazing the disciples trusted Judas never guessed until it was too late. Then we looked at Proverbs chapter 30, verses 7 through 9. The key to those verses, you recall, was contentment. Other passages include Philippians chapter 4, verse 9. Those things which you both learned and received and heard and seen to me do. So Paul set the example. And then he talks about giving. He says, not that I speak in respect of want, for I've learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. Contentment. That's principle number three. Have you learned contentment? He says, I know both how to be abased and how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I'm instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. God tested Paul on that area. Remember, we just talked about it. God gives it to you. Do you view it as a stewardship? You know how God can test that? He can take, take away what you have. Paul says, I learned how to abound. I learned how to hold it in my hands. But I didn't hold it too tight. tight. I learned how to suffer need. There were times when God took it away from Paul. Did you know he might do that to you? Did you know Paul didn't get a chance really to always enjoy what he had? He talks about his physical health. He talks about his beatings. He talks about his shipwrecks. You know, he wasn't on cruises on the Mediterranean for his enjoyment and pleasure. I've been on a cruise on the Mediterranean for enjoyment and pleasure. That was on my honeymoon. It was great. It was wonderful. The Apostle Paul was on the same body of water, and it wasn't for his enjoyment and for his pleasure. I have instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. And then he talks about how the church supported him there. The Philippian church supported him. <coughs> and even when he was in Thessalonica, they sent money to him more than, not more than, uh, more than once. Not because I desire a gift, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. Paul learned that the reason for their giving was not merely so that he would have his needs met because he knew that God would always meet his needs. But it was so that they might receive a blessing. And he goes on, I have... All I abound, I'm full, having received of Epaphroditus the things which were sent from you, an odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to God. And, of course, the, that was the context for verse 19, uh, which is paying the preacher. But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Paul talks about apostates and money in 1 Timothy chapter 6. <coughs> he speaks of the men who have perverse disputes, men of corrupt minds that are destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness from such withdraw thyself. Godliness with contentment is great gain. There we get back to that principle of contentment. That was principle number three. Godliness with contentment is great gain. Having food and raiment, let us be there with content. They that will be rich, those who have a focus on money, fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition, which is what has happened in that money and miracles group. For the love of money is the root of all evil. Now, I didn't say that. The Bible says that doesn't say money is the root of all evil because it is God that giveth you the power to get wealth. God gives it to you as a stewardship, as a trust. What are you going to do with what you've got? Are you going to use it for his glory, for the spread of the gospel, for the good of his people, for meeting the needs of others? How are you going to use what God has? How do you view the riches? Because God gave it to you. But if you have a love for money, did you know that's the foundation? That's the root. That's where the rest of the tree grows from. The reason that plant is still alive is it's got, got roots and there's been some water poured on it. That's amazing because that's been around for a long time now. Since before Christmas, that plant has been there. It's got a root. The root of all evil. Every kind of evil that you can imagine goes back to the love of money. Which while some coveted after they've erred from the faith, that's what those faith healers have done. Their covetousness for money and for power, and in some cases for sex. They've erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. And then he warns you to flee from all of that stuff. 
and fight the good fight of faith. We looked at another striking con, uh, text <coughs> in Hebrews 13, verses 4 through 7. He talks first about marriage and about the purity of the marriage bond and how God curses whoremongers and adulterers. And the very next verse, he says, let your conversation be without covetousness and be content. There we go back again to contentment. Be content with such things as you have, for he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. If you had a choice between as much money and wealth and stuff as you can imagine, I mean, think about the wealthiest people in the world. And whatever they want, they just snap their fingers and some aide comes running and they say, go get such and such for me. That's what I want. I want it quick. And that aide hops to it and he goes out and gets it. Imagine being like that where you can have everything and it's all you've got all this money in the bank and you can go to Switzerland and you can go into the vaults and you can see these stacks of gold up there in the vaults in Switzerland or wherever you happen to have your tax shelter. And suppose you had a choice between having all that and having Jesus who said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Which would you choose? Jesus, who won't leave you or forsake you, you say, but he doesn't give me everything I want. He gives you everything that's good for you, just like he did with Judas. But I want. You know what you're saying? I think I would prefer having what I want rather than having the great promise that Jesus gave, that he will never leave me nor forsake me. You suddenly put that first, that money or that thing or that object or that passion or that desire, instead of putting Jesus in the driver's seat. So that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Suddenly everything about earth grows strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. The apostates are like Judas, Annas, Ananias, Sapphira, Elymas, the sorcerer, and others. They'll do whatever is necessary, including lying, stealing from the church, faking their donations to the church, performing charlatan miracles like a sleight of hand magician, demonically empowered miracles to get money, sex, power, and other personal carnal benefits. And God gave two full chapters. We've talked about those already, so we won't go back over them. But two full chapters in the New Testament. And many other illustrations, such as the seven sons of Sceva who practiced exorcism for money, Simon the sorcerer who wanted to buy the power to give the Holy Spirit by laying on of hands. He gave us another full two chapters besides all those illustrations to warn us about those people. Peter and Jude both write entire chapters against money and miracle charlatans. And Peter makes it clear that their first motive for preaching heresy is covetousness. Through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you. Contrasted with Jesus, he purchased you, they sell you. Jesus paid for you with his blood. They sell you for whatever money they can get out of you. Whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, their damnation slumbereth not. <coughs> Paul gives another reason for preaching apostasy, sex. 2 Timothy 3, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous boasters, there's covetous, love of money, proud, blasphemers, dis disobedient to parents. Young people, listen to that. Put you in a rad, rather bad category. Unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce. That means they didn't have any uh, incontinent means they have no self control. Fierce, despisers of those that are good. Traitors, heady, high minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having the form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. They pretend to be religious. From such turn away. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with diverse lusts. So one of the reasons that people preach apostasy. Ever learning, never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. And then he gives the magicians who stood before Moses as parallel examples. So the Old Testament has some examples of guys who are out there using their supernatural powers for their own benefit and good, but they're under the control of demons. And he closes by saying, but they shall proceed no further, for their folly shall be manifest unto all men as theirs also was. Now we looked at the illustrations over in Second Peter 
<coughs> last week, so I'll just summarize it for you clear, uh, quickly. We won't go back over that same passage. But Peter gives three illustrations to show the character of the apostates, one of which focused on perverted sex, number two, the lust for power, the angels who followed after Satan, and then number three, the rejection of the true God, the world in the days of Noah. Peter talks about that, the angels, the days of Noah, and Sodom. You know what, we have that today exactly happening the same thing. While they promise them liberty, they themselves are servants of corruption, for of whom a man is overcome of the same is he brought into bondage. These people promise you liberty. Christian liberty says that I can do this. Christian liberty lets me listen to what kind of music I want to, make out with whoever I want to, go to places wherever I want to. I've got Christian liberty. I can do whatever I want. Did you know that Christian liberty, that's not the purpose of Christian liberty? Christian liberty does not give you the right to do what you want. Christian liberty gives you the power to do what you ought. Remember that. Christian liberty is not the right to do what you want. Christian liberty is the power to do what you ought to do. In the flesh, you don't have that power. But true Christian liberty is empowered by the Spirit of God. That's one of the main points of the book of Galatians. Christian liberty gives you the power to do what you ought to do, which you could not do in the flesh. As the Holy Spirit empowers you, he enables you to do what God designed you to do. Not just to do what you want to do, but what God designed you to do. For example, I may have used this illustration before, but let me use it again in case you forgot it. Doing what God designed you to do. Now, I have a question for you. How many of you in here brush your teeth with a hammer every morning? Well, okay, maybe not every morning. How many of you ever occasionally brush your teeth with a hammer? What? Nobody. How many of you, I probably shouldn't ask every morning because maybe you don't do it in the morning, but how many of you occasionally brush your teeth with a toothbrush? Okay, good, good. What if you have no teeth? <laughs> You're in trouble. <laughs> you brush your dentures. Okay. <laughs> Ed has a story of praise about today. I'll let, you tell, let him tell it to you afterwards about uh, how his dentures suddenly disappeared and how God miraculously helped him to find them. But <laughs> that is the grace of God. But, okay, why don't you brush your teeth with a hammer? Because that's not what it was designed to do. Let me ask you another question. How many of you ever pounded a nail with a hammer? Well, not, not everybody. O occasionally, you pound a nail with a hammer, don't you? Is that what a hammer is designed to do? Yeah, yeah, okay. Different hammers are designed for different things, but we normally think of a hammer and nails. How many of you ever pounded a nail with a toothbrush? <laughs> Never. Why? Because that's not what it's designed to do. Now, Christian liberty enables you to do what you were designed to do, not just what you want to do. You can do stupid things. Like, you know, you could sit out there with a toothbrush, and you'd probably wear out 10 or 15 toothbrushes before you got that nail pounded into the board. But that's not what it was designed to do. Let's talk about freedom and design. Suppose <clears throat> there was a great, big, wide highway all the way from the East Coast, from Philadelphia, say, to San Francisco. And there were no buildings along the edge of this highway, and there were no um, telephone poles and all those kinds of things. And um, you had enough money to buy yourself a Boeing 747. And so you did. You said, well, I'm scared of heights so I think I'm going to drive this thing all the way from Philadelphia to San Francisco. Now, it might be possible. You know, all along the way, people are going to have to be bringing up big trucks to fill it up. But you're, you're running this baby along the road and really looking cool. And every now and then cars will go past and look up and they think, what a weirdo. <laughs> you know, and you're driving. And you drive. And you actually make it. Now, 
Yeah, 747. A Boeing 747 is an airplane, right? One of the big giant planes that holds like several hundred people, okay? And you drive it. Might be possible. Not probable, but might be possible. Is that plane really free? Or is it free when it's doing what it was designed to do, which is fly? It's when it takes off and in just a few hours lands you 3,000 miles away. Christian liberty, freedom, is not doing stupid things. Christian liberty is not just doing what you want, even if you might actually manage to pull it off. Christian liberty is doing what you were designed to do, designed by God to do. And you and I are only free in our Christian liberty when we are doing that. And you can't do it by pouring water into the gas tank. You have to have jet fuel in the gas tank. And that's the power of the Holy Spirit who enables you to take off and fly above the terrain and the circumstances and the difficulties of life and all the things that are going on down on earth where you fly and are free in the heavens. I hope those illustrations stick every now and then. Because <clears throat> the apostates will promise you liberty, and by liberty they mean bondage. They want you to try to hammer the nail with the toothbrush. They want you to brush your teeth with the hammer. They want you to drive the plane on the ground instead of flying the plane like it was designed to be. They do not offer you liberty no matter how beautifully they try to frame it. What they're offering you is bondage. And that's the point that Peter is making in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 19. And then he goes on and he says, For after <coughs> they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome. The latter end is worse with them than the beginning. Do you know some of these guys have theological degrees? They've been to seminary. They know what the Bible says. I think I've told you before about how my brother and sister and I did a, a, a tour of 40 different concerts in a period of about eight weeks, uh, all up and down the central states and the west coast. And at one of those churches, we didn't know that it was a charismatic church when they signed up for our tour, uh, but uh, they were doing tongues and all kinds of other stuff, and it was a weird service, believe me. I've, I've seen this stuff firsthand. Uh, but uh, after the service, the pastor's daughter took my sister aside to try to talk her into speaking in tongues. And one of the deacons took my brother aside and tried to talk him into speaking in tongues, and he has a real uh, good sense of humor. And so uh, the deacons talked to him, and, I said, and Peter says that deacon, he's the one that made, Peter's the one that made that film that you all have seen. He said, deacon, looking real serious, he says, Oh, you mean like this? He goes, yeah, 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 that's it. And Peter just laughs and says, ha, ha, that's fake. <laughs> he has a lot more chutzpah, that's unmitigated gall, uh, Israeli expression, uh, than I do. But the pastor took me aside. And as he's counting out the money from the offering plate, you know, this was the big deal to him. He was trying to talk me in, into this too. And I said, Pastor so-and-so, I said, uh, did you go to seminary? He said, yeah. I said, did you study Greek? He said, yeah. I said, have you been over this passage and this passage and this passage and you recognize that speaking in tongues is one of the temporary gifts? 1 Corinthians chapter 13, that love chapter makes it clear that it's one of the temporary gifts and that it's no longer being given. He says, well, I know that's what the Bible says. He admitted this to me. I know that's what the Bible says. But if you want the people to give money, you'll get them talking in tongues. And I thought, you apostate, and I walked out on him. That's precisely what Peter is warning about. If after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, he knew the truth. They are again entangled therein and overcome. The latter end is worse with them than the beginning. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it, and he knew it, to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. 
but it's happened unto them according to the true proverb. The dog is turned to his own vomit again, and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. You can clean a pig up on the outside, but you can't clean him up on the inside. He still goes back to the mud. Then Jude. Jude, only one chapter long, but the entire book focuses on the apostates who are in it for the money. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort through this you to earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. I wanted to write you a nice epistle, says Jude. I wanted to talk about that fantastic salvation that God has provided for us. But I realized they don't have much time, don't have much parchment, don't have much ink. So I had to write to you something that was essential for you to know about right now. So I'm giving the whole book to this. How glad we are that God motivated him to do that. That's why we've got this book. He wanted to write something else. God said, write about the apostates. To exhort you should earnestly contend for the faith that was once delivered unto the saints. For there are certain men crept in unawares. They sneak in on you. They're not, they're not up front. Who were before of old ordained to this condemnation. That's double predestination. Now you've heard me preach some sermons on predestination and on election and reprobation. <coughs> where God chooses people to condemnation. That's one of the passages that deals with it here. Ungodly men turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness. That's what we just talked about. So-called Christian liberty. It's not liberty at all, but it's bondage. They take grace and turn the doctrine of grace towards sinners into the doctrine of lasciviousness. That's unmitigated, unrestrained lust. In the 60s, some of you were around back then, you know all the news reports that came out about all the hippies out in California fornicating in the sun on top of their vans and things like this and wearing the paisleys and the bell bottoms and living in communes where nobody knew who was the father of the children of any of the children that were there. They just sort of lived together like animals. That's lasciviousness. The apostates say, no, it's grace because you can do whatever you want. No, remember the principle we just discussed True Christian liberty is not the power or the right to do what you want. It's the power to do what you ought to do. The indwelling power of the Holy Spirit that enables you to do what you were designed to do. That's the answer to the apostates who turn grace into lasciviousness. Denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Remember what God says about holiness? Be ye holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. That's not lascivious. I will therefore put you in remembrance, so you once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believed not. Takes us back to Exodus, where we are in the morning ser sermons. And he uses the angels again, like Peter did. The angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. That's a fascinating study. They have their very own place. There are some specific angels that were so wicked that they are bound all the way until the day of judgment. There are a lot of them running around right now, but there are some that were so wicked they have their very own place and they're already bound there. It's a place called Tartarus. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah, here we have the same illustrations that Peter was using. And the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth an example. Now listen, every homosexual should read this verse and meditate on it and repent and say, God, forgive me. Because what was the end of Sodom and Gomorrah? Suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. God's not joking around. And those are the illustrations that he gives of the apostates, of the people who are in it for the money. Likewise, also these filthy dreamers, we're talking about the apostates, who've crept in awares, who are turning the grace of God into lasciviousness. It's those people, he says, likewise, also these filthy dreamers defile the flesh, despise dominion, they're rebels, and speak evil of dignities. <coughs> 
Those are the people who never want to be under authority because they want to establish their own authority. Yeah, Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke thee. But these speak evil of those things which they know not. But what they know naturally as brute beasts, in those things they corrupt themselves. And here's where they start. They've gone in the way of Cain. They ran greedily after the heir of Balaam for reward. They perished in the gainsaying of court. We've looked at all of those illustrations in our morning worship. There are spots in your feasts of charity. They come to your church dinners when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear. Clouds they are without water. They pretend that they're going to give you something to drink, and they give you nothing. Carried about of winds, trees whose fruit withereth, without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots, raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame, wandering stars, to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. That does not sound happy. And Enoch also the seventh from Adam prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousand of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds, which they have ungodly committed, get the point, and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. And then we get back to one of the things we talked about this morning. These are murmurers, complainers, walking after their own lusts. What did God do to the murmurers and complainers in the Old Testament? He killed them. These are warnings given to churches, to believers. <coughs> Don't follow those kind of people. You know the end of the, those kind of people. The Bible is full of illustrations of those kind of people. All their hard speeches which ungodly speakers have spoken against him. These are murmurers, complainers, walking after their own lusts. Their mouth speaks great swelling words. They're proud, having men's persons in admiration. They fawn because of advantage. But, beloved, remember the words of the Lord, uh, which were spoken before the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how they told you there would be mockers in the last time who should walk after their own ungodly lusts. These be they who are separate themselves, sensual, having not the Spirit. The Holy Spirit never motivates people to do this stuff, ever. But you, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, Keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And if some have compassion, making a difference, and others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire. There are people that are believers who've been caught up by some of these folks. What are you supposed to do? You're supposed to be a fireman. You're in the rescue business. You're on the hook and ladder truck. You're going up to the 15th floor of the building on that ladder as it sways in the wind and his flames are belching out below. And you see a lady with a baby in the window and you reach out and you take the baby from her as the building collapses. Rescue missions. But you've got to be careful in doing it. Pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garments spotted by the flesh. got to be careful not to be pulled into it yourself you know of firefighters and we have a memorial to them of the world trade center where it used to stand first responders police and firemen who were killed as they were trying to rescue others he's giving us the same picture here of those who have been pulled in by the apostates the money and miracles crowd and then you know the verses, verses 24 and 25, which I quote at the end of every service. Covetousness is idolatry. The covetous man is an idolater, and God judges and kills idol worshippers among his people. We talked about that this morning. So, our time is up. So the things we need to remember from this series so far. Remember Lot's wife. She looked back to get her stuff, and she got turned to a pillar of salt. Remember Lot himself. He wanted just a little thing by going to Zoar, and it ended in the death of his wife, and ultimately incest with his daughters who produced two sons, Moab and Ammon, the ancestors of some of Israel's worst enemies. Remember what happened to Achan and how others died because he coveted just a little thing. And there were 36 guys that got killed trying to attack Ai because he had stolen. <coughs> that instance meant it again in Joshua 22.20 as a warning to the people. And it tells us that he didn't perish by himself. His family got killed too. Achan's kids and his wife died with him because they knew the spoil was hidden under the floor of his tent. And they were willing to let him get away with it and not report him. 
when there's sin in the camp, the whole camp suffers. When there's sin in the church, the whole church suffers. The people who cover the sin die along with the sinner. There's a lot to learn there, isn't it? And then we talked about summarizing over this whole time. It's the little sins that kill you, the little stuff that you overlook every day. As Solomon put it, the little foxes are the ones that spoil the vine. God guarantees your sin will find you out. Remember, we looked at that verse in Numbers 32, 23. That's not your sin will be found out. It's your sin will find you out. It stalks you like a wild animal, and it will kill you. Well, we have summarized everything thus far. There's only one more section to go on miracles and money, but the Lord willing, we'll pick that up next week. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you once again. <coughs> for your word and for its power. Keep us from ever being deceived by the glitz of the charlatan apostates and heretics who are in it for the money, who simply want to be in control so that they can have access to whatever they want. But they're liars. They're deceivers. They're focused on the gifts that you've given them rather than on you who gave the gifts. Keep us from having those kinds of attitudes where we focus on the gifts you've given us instead of holding them lightly with a loose hand and looking at them as a stewardship, as a responsibility for which you will hold us accountable. But if you choose to take them away, that we release them without pain and without sorrow because it belonged all to you anyway. Make us good stewards of what you've entrusted to our care and keep us from covetousness in the things of the world because that only brings death and the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil help us to stay away from that love we commit these things to you in Jesus name Amen <clears throat>